Hello, I'm Dr. Monica Lopez, and I'm the CEO and Chief Science Art Officer of La Petite Noseuse Productions. And today, I'm going to talk about transparency, trust, and intention. What dismantling the heart of cyber attack public attribution reveals about warring minds. As I will be discussing the importance of developing a cognitive model of mindsets, from both the attackers and defenders' perspectives in addressing the major problem of cyber attack attribution and public attribution no less, I'd like to start with an assertion the famed fictional detective Sherlock Holmes makes to his colleague, Dr. Watson. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth? Whether you've read the sign of four story or not, you can imagine that Sherlock and Watson are examining a crime scene as they search for the perpetrator's seemingly magical mode of entry. Granted, it's impossible to eliminate the impossible, but what's key here is Sherlock's point about inference to the best explanation in crime sleuthing. It is critical to identify as many alternative hypotheses as possible because such detective work will lead to an objective solution, the truth, and not a subjective impression tainted by bias, like a predetermined expectation. Certainly easier said than done. After all, we're human and by definition filled with biases. Which brings us to the cyber attack attribution problem. We all know that in this world of malicious cyber events, attackers can achieve a high degree of digital anonymity, and frankly, their origins and intentions are not reducible to lines of code. What this entails is that the process of attribution is a multi-layered web of hypotheses built on interpretations upon interpretations of both technical evidence, like zero-day exploits, fake personas, IP addresses, and domain names, and non-technical evidence, the financial, ideological, and geopolitical motivations. And then, when interpretations of culpability enter into open discourse, with or without clear and overt evidence, and complete with geopolitical consequences that are equally good, bad, or unknown, public announcement then becomes a hotbed of debate. What's more, there is no institutionalized mechanism or set of mechanisms in place at the international level for how, when, and who ought to decide on and make a statement of public attribution. And some even go as far as questioning if attribution is even a plausible activity given the difficulty of accurately identifying the source of a cyber intrusion. What this means is that we have a greater tripartite psychological situation at hand. And the first question is that of transparency. What is the nature of the evidence as parts and as a whole, and what constitutes robust and or enough evidence for confident attribution? Secondly, the question of trust. Who do we as a nation state and or set of nation states more globally have confidence in for their attribution capabilities? And thirdly, the question of intent. How strong is the correlation if suitable, between digital fingerprints of behavior and mental states of premeditation and deliberateness of an individual, a group of individuals, and or a state more broadly. As a cognitive scientist, what I find so crucially problematic with cyber attack attribution is that it is so rightly problematic because it essentially asks and then takes action upon the answering of a fundamental question of the black box problem of the human mind brain. How, why, and does actus reus, or a pattern of actions, result from and or lead to mens rea, or particular mental states? I mentioned that I'm a cognitive scientist, and I'll take a quick detour and say a bit about cognitive science and why the integration of this perspective is so critical to addressing the attribution problem. For those of you who are not familiar with the field, you can think of the discipline as the glue of many disciplines related to the understanding of the human mind-brain. Found in the 1950s during the Cognitive Revolution, cognitive science centers on the study of the mind and its processes and merges questions, theories, and methods from computer science, psychology, philosophy, linguistics, anthropology, and neuroscience to understand human perception and cognition and fundamentally reverse engineer the mind-brain. To simplify the very complex phenomenon of human perception and cognition that is paradoxically so intuitive to us, 
The schematic drawing here illustrates that we sense and perceive the world and think and reason about what's happening to move into action. Think about it this way. Perceptual information directly guides our decisions and actions and shapes our beliefs just as internal knowledge of self, others, and the world influences the way we perceive the world. This suggests that perception and cognition are interdependent and we must have a holistic understanding of all of these elements to build a satisfactory model for why and how an individual or set of individuals act the way they do. Just consider how you navigate the world from day to day and spontaneously problem solve and adapt as you move along through a constantly changing environment and how that affects your emotions as much as emotions affect your actions. Continuing down this line of thought, we cognitive brain and computational scientists have been and are currently grappling with the following. We can with relative confidence identify and experimentally control the information that enters into our sense organs or inputs. We can with relative confidence somewhat characterize internal cognitive symbols representing the external environment, known as mental representations, and we can, with relative confidence, observe and measure internal and external behaviors, that is, outputs. However, we cannot yet fully describe and explain the mental processing that happens in between as it is implemented by neural tissue, or our brain. Comparatively, cyber attack attribution and consequent public announcement is, under this perspective, unwittingly a partial gesture of black box revelation, with, in this case, potential national security and large-scale geopolitical consequences. We can, with relative confidence, identify, through reverse engineering the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by threat actors for a particular incident, we can, with relative confidence, and here's where much of the argument begins to break down, correlate such digital behavior with the identified threat actors past digital behavior in combination with their target audience preferences to determine their identity as well as their presumed geopolitical objectives. But still, depending on the organization publicly attributing, we cannot fully describe and explain the data and methods employed that made the attribution possible. Simply put, delineation of actus reus through forensic-based technical means and perhaps even through human intelligence means, such as an informant, if available, leads to identification of a person or organization and mens rea determination. But the link between behavior and mental states is far more complex than the result of a cause and effect relationship, as is proving deliberateness beyond a reasonable doubt. In fact, determining the culprit can be especially difficult when the situation suggests state-sponsored involvement. I'm sure that most of us here would acknowledge that even when a person has been clearly identified as being inside or a citizen of the attributed country, it still may not be definitively clear from the forensics whether that person is a contractor or an employee operating at the behest of their national government or simply someone operating on their own volition. Non-digital clues become paramount. And matters are made even more complicated when a particular entity publicly attributes. Remember, attribution is about identifying a narrative of responsibility for an action or set of actions that have led to conflict or harm, in this case, from cyber attacks. Four entities can individually and or collectively publicly attribute a cyber attack. The government, private industry, academia, and anonymous vigilance and journalist investigators. All three entities, however, have different internal, institutional, and or individual goals. Each are met with different expectations by the public, and each have varying degrees of power and persuasion both nationally and internationally. And as I mentioned earlier, there are no established international standards in regards to the how, when, and who of attribution. So the door remains open for each entity to play by its own rules. While I will not go through all the detailed reasons to attribute or not to attribute, a summary breakdown of each entity will underscore the array of motivations. In essence, the government in a democracy fundamentally has as its role to be transparent in its methods and motivations with the public and has the clout to prosecute offenders. 
The very same transparency, however, can jeopardize technical methods and practices and national and foreign policy interests. In private industry, where mass public exposure equals dollar signs and rapid growth of customers influence both production, demand, and branding identity, attribution boils down to a balance between profit gains and customer satisfaction. In academia, where its role in cyber attack attribution is not yet entirely established and only beginning to gain traction, attribution here will boil down to both the breaking of academic silos and the maintenance, at least in the public's eye, of academia's general reputation in promoting rigorous and honest science. As for anonymous vigilance and journalist investigators in their ultimate search for truth, they sit in a precarious position as they balance their moral convictions and risk their livelihoods and even lives. Now, in dividing each entity into to attribute and to not attribute, I note that they do not stand in opposition from one another as in one or the other categories. The dotted lines precisely suggest a flexibility between factors. Acknowledging, of course, that decision-making regarding public attribution is very much the result of a combination of reasons and attributing or not attributing is a far more fluid process. However, what this further highlights, and when many say, quote, attribution is an art as much as a science, unquote, and given the fact that states ultimately do as they wish in the absence of established standards, we have an almost surrendering to the volatility of perception. And thus we have a compounded problem. Not only are unsteady correlations made between patterns of actions and particular mental states, but the public attribution of a cyber attack, as we discussed, is further laden with different entities choosing as they deem fit why, how, and when to identify a narrative of responsibility. All, of course, indirectly or directly influenced by the surrounding social cultural landscape. Now, the devil's advocate could reply, well, naturally. We're dealing with a system created by humans for humans who have acquired norms and beliefs through enculturation and the unpredictability of the future is a fact. So, of course, biases and ambiguity will pervade throughout. And yet Edmund Lacard's exchange principle about the physical world is not for nothing. It is undeniable that every contact leaves a trace, even in the world of the internet, where its very makeup lends itself to anonymity for which proposals for its re-engineering have been suggested, it does not preclude the fact that every individual human behind a cyber attack exists in the physical world. As a result, something will be left behind as much as something will be transported away. So in the absence of microscopic hairs and fibers, and with the occlusion and destruction of digital footprints, that something found within the non-digital environment requires and acquires significant evidential status. And a large part of the answer lies, I believe, in rethinking cybersecurity R&D. So how, you may be asking? Well, by making a theoretical and cognitive analogy between real-time improvisation and adaptive problem solving, and the inventive threats perpetrated by hackers as well as the defenders' predictive creative problem solving required to thwart. And also by integrating the R&D work my company has done on human creativity and intelligence using the arts to precisely develop a cognitive behavioral model of spontaneous, real-time adaptability and decision-making. Now let's look at an example. In this model here, we have the following. Using various productions of live theater and musical improvisation, our goal was to identify the wide variety of factors, such as complex variables like emotion implicated in real-time problem solving to establish an ecologically realistic predictive model of possible improvisatory outcomes and their effect on the audience. Briefly, in this part of the model, we identified various multi-sensory variables, such as the visual and linguistic information constantly in flux, that influence how a musical improviser will react in real time with any number of possible musical sequences. In this following part of the model, we have the identification of very specific elements of the visual and linguistic information identified, as well as the combination of musical building blocks utilized to represent a closed set of emotional concepts. 
Here, we characterize the various goals of the improvisatory process and how various multisensory features enter into the problem-solving process and actually influence the change of goals across time. And finally, we identified the interdependent novel ideas, focused concepts, and enhanced emotion to explain the resulting live experience. So why the arts? You may be asking this by now. Well, because the arts are a fantastic cognitive behavioral framework from which to understand the multi-layered complexity of human behavior, given their multidimensionality and interdependent roles of individual expression, technical elements, emotional motivations, and broader social political messaging, which is very much analogous to cybercrime situations, be it from the attacker's or defender's perspective. As a parallel example, just consider a security analyst position in situational awareness. Their role is in holistically understanding an enterprise's information security environment to efficiently and accurately predict and respond to potential threats by actively monitoring their awareness of the network, the threat itself, and the mission during real-time crisis action response. This role in and of itself needs to not just focus on simulations of existing or past attacks to prevent, detect, mitigate, and recover, but crucially to predict in a multidirectional way something completely elusive to artificial intelligence-based threat detection algorithms currently gaining popularity. My point is that ultimately the goal is the creation of a global mental model that consists of identifying the micro mental models like emotional influences, knowledge structures, ideation phases, and external incoming information fundamental to improvisatory real-time adaptive behavior necessary for success within a changing environment. Because that is equivalent to identifying the mental models of hackers spontaneously adapting in real time to the continuously changing cyber landscape to stay and steps ahead of their volatile victims, which is equivalent to identifying the mental models of defenders spontaneously predicting and adapting in real time to the incoming, continuously changing cyber attacks to steer away end steps from the perpetrators. Which brings me back to the greater tripartite situation of the need to answer three main questions I brought up earlier. Transparency, or the nature of the evidence. Trust, or our confidence in who is making an attribution claim, and intent, or the strength of the correlation between behavior and mental states. And amid all the biases and ambiguities of human perception and cognition, we need to build robust mental models of both attackers and defenders' behavior because those models will then improve transparency, trust, and intent. Because again, cyber users, defenders, and attackers are all human. And when we characterize the trending causes of cyber crime, beliefs, wants, and desires are the emotional motivators underlying economic, personal, political, and or ideological gains from cyber crime. And the fact of the matter is we humans are efficient at dynamically understanding the various features of these emotional variables. Years of evolution have endowed us with the intelligent capacity to do so in order to adapt. But we must make the variables explicit and then integrate them within our detection, prediction, and reverse engineering models. As many analysts know, many attackers are consistent in their behaviors and not only the victims they choose and how they inadvertently identify themselves digitally but in how they operate throughout the attack cycle after establishing a foothold in the compromised network. One obvious example is the use of privilege escalation tools. In conclusion, my proposal is the following. Like the existential crisis that healthcare industry is dealing with, where we can no longer just treat disease after the fact, but need to prevent disease with a holistic perspective on mind, body, and the environment, Cybersecurity needs a similar paradigm shift. We need to spend far more serious efforts in predicting and preventing human creative behavior before the attack, 
not just ad hoc by wading through what we think is evidence. We need new methods. And new methods that include human cognitive behavioral models that are predictively useful towards developing sophisticated mathematical models to then fine tune algorithms for both data mining and artificial intelligence training towards the detection of advanced persistent threats. But that will only happen if we cross disciplines. And when we integrate what we know and need to know about human perception, behavior, and cognition to hack the minds of hackers, just as hackers are hacking our minds. Because in the end, it's all about creative minds at war with each other. I include here a list of sources relevant to some of the points I made. And finally, on that note, thank you very much for listening. And if you would like to contact me, you can reach me at monica at lpnproductions.com. Again, thank you. <laughs>